So a brief background. Chest pain accounts for at least 10% of all, all emergency room visits. If you're going to be in an emergency room, almost certainly in a duty time, you're going to find at least a few patients coming to you with chest pain or something you know, similar. Now, the real challenge in this situation lies in discriminating very life-threatening or potentially threatening causes from non-threatening or benign causes. And the one which threatening cause which we are going to specifically focus on is acute coronary syndrome. Now, the classical term myocardial infarction, unstable angina, ST elevation MI, non-ST elevation MI, all of these have been now clubbed together in basically to say that there is an acute coronary syndrome, wherein we mean that there is an acute coronary event which is going on and that kind of needs urgent attention. Now, the first thing to, to kind of keep in mind is that never you can consider one test or one particular finding in isolation. And always it's important to keep the overall picture in mind. So when you're faced with this kind of a scenario, basically you need to have some questions in your mind. Is it myocardial infarction or an ACS? How do you go about evaluating it? Does the patient need to be admitted into the hospital or can they be safely discharged home? These are the practical uh, decision making points which you're going to be faced with and which you're going to have to answer to yourself as well as to the patient. So when we look at chest pain as a symptom, you know, we have potentially high risk causes. As I said, we'll mainly focus on ACS. There are some others like pulmonary embolism, acute aortic dissection. Any of these, if when you don't act promptly, you can potentially end up with a major issue. Intermediate risk causes, some of which are pneumothorax or a pneumonia. And then you have the low risk causes such as pericarditis secondary to a viral infection or just musculoskeletal pain, which is again, you know, pretty common. Acidity or gastroesophageal reflux disease, these kind of things, which, you know, really need some uh, symptomatic medication. And then, you know, the patient should really uh, uh, can go home. So that is what you need to kind of categorize and see where in the spectrum a particular patient falls. So what can be done at the general practitioner level? Because it's very likely that many of these people at the first presentation are going to come to a general practitioner. And it is up to the general practitioner to see how appropriately to triage and when appropriately to refer. These are major responsibilities. So I would like to kind of give you a three point approach. Consider the pain, consider the background, and consider relevant investigations. So what do we mean when we say consider the pain? The key question which you have to answer is, is this angina or is it something else? Another way to put it is, is this originating from the heart and is of a potentially serious nature or not? So this is something, um, a kind of classical point, which many of us have learned as medical students. We call it the PQR of the chest pain. I think all of you know that you have the PQ and R waves in the ECG. Similarly, you can think about the PQ and R of chest pain. The most important is the Q or the quality of the pain. Then you have to think of the flanking P, the precipitating factors and the R, the relieving factors. So what kind of pain signifies angina? Again, many of you may be aware of this, but it's well worth re-emphasizing. So the classic anginal pain is described as a pressing or a heaviness, and also sometimes as a burning kind of a pain. It's really most of the time central rather than a left-sided chest pain. And also the classical pain of myocardial infarction is difficult to localize to one spot. So generally, as you can see on the picture on the left, the patient would kind of put a fist to his chest or kind of complain of an ill-localized but disturbing uh, discomfort rather than be able to point a finger and say that this is exactly where it is paining in a sharp kind of fashion. So these are kind of the qualities of the anginal pain which you should look for. Then you also have the characteristic radiation. Now the characteristic sites of radiation we talk about are the arm, which is more often the left arm, but also could be the right arm, the shoulder and the jaw. But 
limits have been described based on a lot of observations as to what are the limits of radiation of anginal pain that's typically said to be from anywhere between the mandible to the umbilicus now this is important to keep in mind because sometimes patients can predominantly present with epigastric kind of a discomfort and one should not think that okay it's not in the chest so this is not going to be related to the heart so keep in mind the potential limits of radiation of anginal pain then another important feature to keep in mind is that many of them often have associated symptoms of some kind of autonomic arousal so this could be like um, palpitation sweating nausea a general feeling of unease which has been sometimes described as a feeling of doom sometimes they may tell you that look the pain is not very severe but somehow i'm not feeling very right and this this kind of some uh, feeling often accompanies uh, anginal pain especially in an acute coronary syndrome the other thing to note is that many times anginal pain can build up gradually from an onset and then build up to a crescendo whereas some other kinds of pains like aortic dissection can be like a bolt from the blue and can be maximal at onset so these are some of the other pointers which you can keep in mind so we talked about the central cue the quality of the pain then you look at either sides of it how is it precipitated and how is it relieved characteristically anginal pain is precipitated by physical effort emotional stress sometimes by a heavy meal sometimes by exposure to cold weather and so forth whereas on the other hand it's relieved typically by rest another important um, history which is often overlooked but sometimes patients may be waiting to tell you is that they took a sublingual tablet right and nitrates are especially uh, prompt in relieving anginal pain and generally the relief is within 2 to 10 minutes now if somebody tells you that i had a uh, pain and then i took some rest and it relieved after a very long time that either may not be angina or it may be a very sinister kind of a situation where you find that sometimes in the situation of an acute coronary syndrome the general rules of effort and jana do not apply you may have a very long time persistent pain despite rest and that could be a potentially an ominous sign so we talked about how classical anginal pain sounds like now bear in mind that patients will come to you with a classical description so which is why i already said that this is going to be one of the points and you're going to use this along with other pointers to consider the overall picture always so let's look at some of the characteristics which are unlikely to indicate anginal pain now the pain is very sharp if it can be very localized and you, and you know we talked about the finger pointing uh, sign if it's especially related to respiration which is worsen by breathing or inspiration if it's fleeting by which we mean to say that it's it's in a particular spot at one time and then it sharply moves to some other spot if there is any kind of postural variation the patient says okay when i lie down the patient is the pain is worse when i sit up it's better if there is local tenderness the patient is able to point to a particular spot and when you press there there's actually you know tenderness in the patient winces these are very unlikely characteristics of anginal pain and again we talked about the limits of radiation so infra umbilical pain especially is very unlikely to be related to the heart so these are some of the contrary points which you can bear in mind so this is as far as considering the pain is concerned so then look at the background what kind of patient is coming to you with this symptom what kind of patient is coming to you with this pain so there are few points to consider in the background what is the age of the patient now if a 20 year old man you know who has absolutely no risk factors has been very fit comes to you with a very sharp and localized pain versus a 55 year old middle aged smoker who comes to you with some kind of a vague discomfort the two are pretty different scenarios so already your mind is attuned to that second thing what are the risk factors which are present classical coronary risk factors diabetes hypertension hyperlipidemia smoking family history all of these the third point is there already a prior coronary artery disease now obviously the risk of a recurrent event in somebody with existing coronary artery disease is going to be higher as compared to a person who's never had coronary artery disease before then what about prior symptoms of angina 
Now, this can be very useful sometimes because when you're faced with a patient with kind of vague symptoms and you're not sure what this means, sometimes you can ask a question. If a patient has had a diagnosed MI before or a diagnosed unstable angina before, he may be able to tell you, you know what, doctor, this pain which I'm having today is pretty much similar to what I had at that time. And at that time, I was diagnosed to have an MI. This is a very useful clue in history because the character of angina can sometimes differ from person to person. But a person who's able to tell you that this episode kind of mimics what I had earlier, then that is something to be taken into consideration. So when you look at all of these things, the third, quest, the third point which we said is to consider the investigations, relevant investigations. And we'll talk just about uh, two or three important ones and not going to the whole gamut of it. So how to evaluate when you look at such a person in the acute setting, for example, in the ER. The first evaluation is not really focused on what the diagnosis is. The first evaluation is focused on the stability of the patient always. So you look at the vital signs. And secondly, you look for objective signs of cardiac involvement. Now, in a patient with some kind of a, a pain, you know, if you have a absolutely a totally a normal looking cardiovascular system, that may or may not indicate anginal pain. Now, on the other hand, if you already have objective signs of cardiac involvement, like you have signs of heart failure and so forth, then your suspicion is obviously heightened. Now, preliminarily, what would be a couple of high risk features? Anybody who comes to you with rest pain, which has lasted more than 20 minutes, or with any kind of ongoing hemodynamic instability, you know that there's something, some kind of an issue going on, whether it's finally going to be an MI or one of the other high risk causes may still be open for discussion. But basically, it's going to kind of warn you that there is a potential issue going on.